Okay, hello. So sorry we're starting a couple minutes late. This is Level Up, taking your WordPress code up a notch. If you'd like to follow along, I have a slide link in the upper left corner, and that's on a bunch of the slides, so if you miss it, don't worry, it'll reappear. Before we get into the talk, I want to just tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Amanda Giles, and I've been an independent IT consultant for a little over 10 years now. I'm primarily a WordPress theme developer at this point, although I've done a lot of other things in the past. I've been using WordPress since 2009, and it's just gradually kind of taken over more and more of my life. Part of that is that I founded the Seacoast New Hampshire WordPress Meetup in 2011, so we meet monthly up in Portsmouth. So if you're somewhere north of Boston, you might consider just looking for our meetup. We do a meetup every month. And uh, we actually find folks at HU Hosting who are here, sponsor our meetup, so we even have pizza. <laughs> Um, I also co-created a WordPress web development agency in 2006 called uh, Spark Development, and I've been speaking at WordCamps uh, in New England and occasionally further away since 2014. Um, a little just personally, I'm a big Halloween fan. You can see me here in my Halloween costume this past year. I'm a board member of the Portsmouth Halloween Parade. Again, if you're north of Boston, you should totally check it out every year on October 31st. Um, I'm also a kettlebeller, a poetess, and I am known for my loud and frequent sneezing. So. <laughs> I can throw something fun in there because now I'm going to throw a lot of serious stuff. Well, maybe not yet. Um, so the point of this talk really is to give you a set of tools um, that you can use to take your coding to the next level. And like all tools, you're not going to master them all right away. Um, I'm going to just kind of lay out a bunch of tools, and some of them maybe you know, maybe some of them you don't. Uh, unfortunately, I can't make you into a code guru in the half an hour we have. But I will do my best to introduce you to some tools and give you some resources. Um, I'm also going to try to cram in a lot, although I, I, I specifically tried not to cram too much in. So we'll see how I do. We got a little bit of a late start, but um, let's go. So the first thing I want to talk about is debugging. And this is really Developer 101. Hopefully, if you're writing code, you're already familiar with this, but I just feel an obligation to include it. The simplest kind of debugging that you can do here is to go into your WP config file and set these, um, set these flags here. So one of them is going to turn debug on. The second one is going to set the debug log on. And then I also like to set the debug display to false. So that means whatever warnings or errors your um, theme or plugin, whatever you're developing, and other people's, and it won't be just yours. Once you turn debug on, all of the warnings and errors um, from any plugins or your theme will show up in this log, but they won't show up on the screen. So they give you a great way to find out what's going on. So when you see something happening on the screen or not happening, then you can go in there and look. I will give you a word of warning that you want to make sure that you turn this off on production. So I. <laughs> Depending how many plugins you have installed and how sloppy the code is written, this file can get really big. And I had a site that launched about a year ago, really big tourism site, debug log was left on, um, we were using Backup Buddy, the daily backups were going fine, the complete backups were failing, but Backup Buddy doesn't tell you that because the daily database backup was still going. Turns out the debug log had grown to two gigabytes, and so it was just timing out. So just please. You don't have to delete the file, you can keep the file, but you need to turn debug off when you go into production. So some other good things to know, some developer plugins. The first one is literally called the developer plugin, and it's literally a gateway plugin. It gives you a list of 11 other plugins and makes it super easy to install them. So you, it doesn't automatically install all of them, but it gives you a choice, and a lot of them are great plugins to use in development. One of them that it installs is called the debug bar plugin. And this is a plugin that also has a couple add-ons, but just at its core, it adds this great debug menu um, on both the front and back end of your site. It'll show you the template that was used. It'll show you the queries that were run, each individual query, query, how much time. So it's great if you're trying to fine-tune performance. And it will tell you what's in the WP query object for, your main, um, for the main query on your page. Another great one is the Query Monitor plugin. This provides some similar information to the debug bar plugin, but it also has some great options where it will show you all of the hooks and what was executed, and it will also let you filter the queries that were run by what function called them or what 
um, component. So if it was a plugin or whether it was WordPress core. So again, just gives you a real insight to what's happening. And I recommend just checking both of them out, using them, seeing what works for you, what's going to give you the information that you need. If you use the debug bar plugin, you do have to put one extra flag in your WP config, and this is a save queries flag to true. And again, you probably want to turn this off when you go into production then. So the first thing I want to talk about is hooks. I know that Mark in the previous talk talked a little bit about this, but they are, they are just so important, I, we can't talk about them enough. So um, first question, of course, is what is a hook? A hook is literally an event or if you want to think about it as a point in time in your WordPress code that will allow for additional code to be run. And people who write WordPress core, themes, and plugins put these hooks in, and they specifically put hooks in at specific points for developers to hook into. The hooks that are added um, are sometimes used by the actual developers as well. Certainly WordPress uses its own hooks, but um, they're in there so that you can hook in and add your code and, and um, your process to it. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, okay, so two types of hooks. Um, action hooks and filter hooks. Action hooks are the simpler hook. They allow something to run at a certain point in time. So in, in cases in WordPress would include initialization, before your main queries run, the header, the footer. Um, they're everywhere in the, in the process. And filter hooks are similar action hooks. They also run at a point in time, but they are centered around um, a piece of information, some kind of data or content. And what a filter hook does is it will pass some information to you, and in your function, you can then take a look at it and choose to modify it or do something with it and pass it back. And that is the important part, is that you need to pass it back, unless you're specifically trying to wipe it out. So if you have a filter hook and you put it in, you're doing something, and suddenly your whole screen is gone, you want to check your function, you probably forgot to return that content back. You might have done whatever you wanted, but if you don't return it back, then it thinks you're purposely removing that content. So, so examples include displaying content, uh, there are hooks in there for like page post title, before saving content in the admin, after saving content, um, lots of plugins, um, use filter hooks, lots of themes, so they're uh, again, they're a little more complex than action hooks, but they have the same basic principle. They, they happen at a certain point in time. I did steal some of this from last year's presentation that I did on um, hooks and filters. So you may have seen this last year, but this is my favorite real life example. So when you go to a bar and they call last call at the end of the night, that's essentially a real life action hook. The bartender is like, hey, this is it. Does anybody else need a drink? Everybody puts in their order, and then the bartender processes the orders processes all of them, processes them in a certain priority, and then is done. So, quick example of what the code looks like. So when you do an action hook, there's um, two pieces of the hook code. So the top part of this is the part where the hook is activated. In this case, in WordPress core, this example, I'm using a logout hook. So when you log out of WordPress from your user account, there's a hook that happens. And in this example, I am using that hook to clear my session data. So I want to clear out my customer ID, I want to clear out whatever was in their cart. And so the top part of this code, do action, calls, uh, it's do action wp underscore logout, and that's the name of the hook. And then underneath, this is the code that I would have in my theme or my plugin, and it's, it's two parts. One is the actual function, where I clear the session data, and then the important piece is called add underscore action, and that is a function that's going to link that hook name, WP logout, with my function name, clear session data. So it essentially marries the two, and that code can be, can be anywhere. So again, that's the simpler example. The filter hook example, um, very simple example, because I need something that will fit on a slide, but this is for the excerpt length. So again, this top part of the code is in WordPress core. WordPress defaults the excerpt to 55 words. And unlike do action where it just calls a name, because this is a filter hook, it uses the function to activate the filter hook is called apply filters. And it passes the name of the hook, and then it also passes some data. In this case, it's passing the value of 55 words. Now this is a very simple filter. It could pass additional arguments, could pass additional parameters to the function. 
Um, in this case, it doesn't. And if so, those additional pieces of data are just for you to have in your function to make a decision. They're not, con they're not data that you're going to return. They're just, they could be additional information. And then down below, similar to our action hook, we have a custom excerpt length function that's going to change that value to 20. And we have an add underscore filter call. So previously, we had add underscore action. In this case, we have add underscore filter. We have the name of our hook, excerpt length. Then we have the name of our function, custom excerpt length. And then this third parameter is a priority. So we didn't set a priority in the previous example, but when you add filter or add action and connect your function to a WordPress hook name, you have the option of setting a priority as to when that function runs. If you don't specify a priority, the default is 10. Now it's going to start at the lower numbers and go to the higher numbers. So if you need it to happen, if you need your action or filter to happen before any of the default actions, you want to set it to something below 10. If you want it to happen later, you're going to set it to something later than 10. So in this case, I don't want another, um, I don't want another hook from a plugin or something changing my excerpt length after I've changed it. So I'm setting it to 999 and hoping that nobody has set it to 9999, their own custom one, because all of the functions that are associated with a particular hook name will be run. And they will be run in whatever priority WordPress can sees them. So they default to 10, they can have different numbers. If they have the same number, they're going to run in whatever order WordPress learned about them. Just, so you, just a quick reminder, if you want to follow along the slides, there is a link in the upper right. And once you do get to the slides, on some of the slides in the lower right um, are some additional hooks, uh, I'm sorry, links, um, usually in green, and they'll link to resources um, on the codex or in the uh, WordPress developer resources. So hooks are super important to understand. Like I said, I know Mark talked about them as well, and I could talk about them all day. Um, they uh, I actually linked here on this slide to my talk last year, so if you want to understand more about hooks and filters, I have a full-length talk on them. But just to emphasize again, hooks are placed in WordPress core and plugins and theme code, and they're specifically placed to allow customization without directly editing the code. So you've probably heard you shouldn't edit WordPress core, um, you've probably realized that if you edit a plugin, you're not going to be able to get any updates from that, or you're going to lose your updates when you update them. So hooks are this very important way to um, change what's happening without directly editing somebody else's code. And they are, they are the proper way or the WordPress way to alter this behavior. Some of the common hooks that you might use, um, particularly as a theme developer, I use a lot of these. Init is the initial hook when it's when WordPress is loading. Template redirect, I use that a lot to um, take some information and perhaps direct a user to another page, so I'm not having duplicate content or depending what I have going on. WP head will put stuff into your header tag, so if you have a little piece of JavaScript that needs to run that's not an external file, say it's a Google snippet or something, you might use WP head. WP and Q scripts allows you to enqueue scripts and styles into uh, WordPress, and it's, it's also a correct way to add those scripts in. There's also a, uh, I didn't put it on here, but there's a WP admin in QScripts, so if you want to add styles or scripts to the back end of your site, you can use that link. Um, Pre-get posts. Uh, as a theme developer, this is, this is so important. I'll talk about it more in a minute, but pre-get posts allows you to modify the main query that's happening on your WordPress page before it's actually run. So rather than going to your template page and then maybe writing a whole new query, pre-get posts lets you change whatever it is about that query. So maybe on a category page, in a certain category, you don't want to show 10 posts, the default. You want to show 50, or you want to show all of them. I want to be careful about that. Um, you can change, you can add or remove whatever criteria is happening, and the important thing is that you're modifying it before the query is run. All right, so I couldn't help myself in talking about it now. Um, the underscore content is a filter if you're using that function. There is a filter there so that you can see that content, you can add something to it, you can you know, edit, edit that content in whatever you see fit, and then again pass it back. That one is a filter hook. WP footer. Similar to WP head, except it lets you put scripts 
um, or other content in the footer of your site. So I use this one a lot when my clients call up and they want tracking pixels added. You know, I get something from um, the site. I'll, I'll use WP Footer if it's a piece of script, or I'll use uh, WP and Q scripts if it's something that I can that I actually have an external script for. And save post is something, it's a hook in the admin, and I use it a lot to, uh, if I have to process data anytime something's changed in the admin, every time a particular type of post is changed, I can, I can add my own bit of logic in there. So pre-get posts, I kind of started to go into this because I couldn't help myself last time, but pre-get posts is, uh, to reemphasize, is the hook that happens basically after the query object is created, but before that query is run against the database. So, and it's kind of an odd hook because it seems like, based on what I've said, it, you would think it would be a filter hook, that you would be passing the query arguments and then modifying them and passing them back. But it actually passes them by reference, and so pre-get post is actually an action hook. So you don't need to pass something back. It does pass the query object to you, but then you actually change the query object directly. So, a little gotcha. Again, there's a link in the bottom right here that's going to take you to a page to learn more about pre-get posts. WP Query. Learn it, love it, use it. Um, if you've used it before, certainly it seems pretty straightforward, but they've added some stuff over the past few years that have really made it very powerful. So what WP Query is, is it allows you to generate queries. and I say here, it allows you to easily generate complex queries because if you're running a very simple query where you're just pulling top 10 posts from this category that maybe have this tag, then you probably don't need WP Query. You can probably use get posts or another function. But where WP Query really comes in handy is when you need to run more complex queries. And it's a great way, um, you know, five years ago there were times when I just had to like I either didn't know WQuery did this or probably didn't then, but I would sometimes have to just write a custom query against the database, which obviously, if you can avoid that, it's better. You'll get a lot of efficiency from using the tools that are in WordPress, and uh, WPQuery is one of those. But that's part of the reason that I suggest using get posts if you can, because if you use get posts, then you already have WordPress's kind of built-in logic, caching, WordPress is gonna know like, hey, you just asked for this content. So WP Query, though, is when you need to pull out the big guns. Um, so things like multiple taxonomies or combinations of them, there's a feature called Tax Query. If you need to do multiple meta fields, there's a meta query. There's also a date search with date query. And you can use these kind of all together. So uh, just a simple example is if I wanted to have a book site and I wanted to pull all of the featured books in my technology section. And maybe featured and technology are both genres that I have set up as a taxonomy. So in a normal scenario, if I tried to use get posts and I said featured and technology, it's gonna give me books that are in either. And what I really want is the cross section of the two. So I want my featured books that are also in technology. And so using WP Query and understanding how to use that tax query allows me to specifically say that it has to be in featured and it has to be in technology. And it can be more than that. I can also have, you know, I can also be combining that with a date search, with a meta custom field search. So the, the point just is that it does, it does a lot for you, and if you need to write a complex query, I definitely recommend uh, getting into it. It's helpful. So one thing to know, though, is if you do use WP Query, um, if you use WP Query and then you run through your results and you use the function called the underscore post, the underscore post sets up all your template tag functions. So if you run the underscore post, it lets you then run functions like the title, the permalink, the content to pull from that current post. So the problem is if you're using WP Query to write an additional query on your page, so after you're done, you need to run this function called WP Reset Post Data that will reset the uh, main post object to be the current um, object that's on your page. So an example of this is if you, let's say you have some content and then maybe you wrote a custom thing to show some related posts at the bottom. So if you run through those, those related posts and you run the underscore posts so that you can use the template tags, if you fail to run WP Reset Post Data, and the next code that your WordPress uh, site runs into is your sidebar code, 
your sidebar is actually going to think you're on the last related post and not your actual current post. So if there's other logic in your footer or your sidebar, than it usually is, that's dependent on the current post, for instance, maybe showing the correct sidebar. Um, it's, not going to, uh, it's not going to be on the correct post unless you run WP reset post data. So again, it's only an issue if you're using the underscore post, but it's important to know. Short codes. Um, I like to cover this because I think when I was first a developer, I was like, oh, I couldn't, like short codes, I, I couldn't write a short code. Um, and the first time I looked into how to write them, they're actually surprisingly simple. So there's something I wanted to share. If you're not that familiar with a short code, a short code essentially takes input from a WordPress user that's entered in your admin area, so into a post or a page or a widget area. And when it's viewed on the front end of your site, WordPress is going to translate that short code into some kind of output for your visitor. So you probably use short codes. Um, and maybe you weren't really aware of them, maybe you were. <clears throat> the WordPress has built-in short codes for um, gallery and other things. A lot of plugins come with short codes. Just a quick example of what they look like. In this example, I actually colored the short code text blue just for visibility. It wouldn't normally appear that way. So this is an example of a contact us page, and it has two short codes on it. The first one is an email short code, and in this format, I put the Start email is in brackets, then there's some content in between, in this case the email address, and then there's a closing tag, which matches the front tag, except it also has a slash in the front. And we'll look at this actual code in a minute. All it's going to do is encrypt this email address so that the uh, spam bots can't read it. So it's going to randomly encrypt that address. And then the second code, you might have seen something like this, especially if you use Gravity Forms. This is a short code that was generated by clicking that Add Form button, and Gravity Forms has a nice interface, and it wrote the short code for me. But once it writes it, I can do whatever I want with it. Um, but it has an interface to write for you. So just in case you haven't used them. And the Gravity Forms one has a slightly different format. You'll see that it has attribute value pairs within that opening tag. So the Gravity Form, you have the open bracket Gravity Form, and then before that tag is closed, it actually has information about which form, whether to show the title, whether to show the description. And it actually doesn't really have a close. There is no closing tag, so it's essentially a self-contained tag. A few things to consider uh, with short codes. They're not super intuitive to use for your users, so you do have to think about if you have theme users that are perhaps not too savvy. Um, they are very prone to typos. If you make a typo, your short code will not work. <laughs> um, and there's no visible guidance for your user unless you built an interface like Gravity Forms where you have a form that comes up to generate the short code for the user. But the great thing about them is you can put them in any content area, including which areas. You can copy them, and they are a lot less coding than widgets. So a quick example of the code. Again, not that you'll be an expert when we leave, but just to give an idea of how simple it is. This is a very simple function using email and code. I could have written this all in one line, but it would not fit in the, in the slide then. There's two components. One is the actual function, and then one is the add underscore short code call. And this works similar to do action and apply filter in that it's going to connect, in this case, my short code name, email, with my function name which is email encode function. And in the email encode function, the first thing that gets passed are <coughs> any attributes, if they exist. So in, just like in that Gravity Forms tag where there were attributes. And then the content, which is anything that appears in between the opening and closing tag. And in the function, I'm just checking, did I actually get an email address? And if not, I'm exiting. And then if I did, I'm using a built-in function in WordPress called anti-spambot to encrypt both the mail to part of the link and also the email address that I'm displaying on the screen. And anti-spambot is great because it encrypts it partially and randomly. So it won't even encrypt it the same way on, on multiple pages. And the important thing about a short code is that you have to return the output. You don't want to echo it to the screen. You want to return it because the short code is processed in the midst of your other content. So if you just echo that, it's going to appear above the rest of your content. It's going to appear where it ran it. So you want to return it so that it gets embedded in your content in the correct place. And I mentioned short codes in widgets. If you want to have short codes in text widgets, you actually have to add 
a little bit of code, which should look familiar, having gone through hooks now. You have to add a filter. Um, you have to call add filter with widget underscore text, and you have to associate the do shortcode function with it. And what that tells WordPress is, hey, when you're processing the text in a widget text object, the default text widget that comes with WordPress, run do shortcode over that text. So any shortcodes in there then will get automatically processed. Widgets. So widgets are a little more complicated. Um, they have some other great benefits, though. Uh, we'll, we'll just start with the negative. We'll move from the negative to the positive. So uh, the downsides of widgets can be that you can only put them in widget areas. You can't just drop them in the middle of your regular content. You can't copy them, although I think there are some plugins that allow you to duplicate them. And they're more coding than, um, than your short codes are. You have to understand a little more about form logic and saving. The great thing about them, though, especially for the user side, is that they are drag and drop. They're super easy and intuitive. Your user does not have to remember the name of the short code or the attributes you set up. They just make their choices on a form. And you can include descriptive text on there because you are creating the form that appears in the widget in the back end. You get to create that form. So you can add as much helpful text as you want uh, for your users. The anatomy of a widget, um, there's five pieces of it, and we're not going to go deep in every piece, but just to you if you're familiar with the components. The first thing is um, it's all put into a class, which you'll see in a minute. The first thing you need to do is there's a declaration construct, and that's going to tell WordPress some information about your widget, how to refer to it, what its um, unique identifying information is. The second piece is that you, of course, have to generate the form that appears in the admin. So this is the form where you're going to make selections as a user um, who is setting up the widget in under appearance widgets. Then, of course, whatever decisions they make in that form, you need to save that. So there's an update save logic function in there where you're going to write those choices in. Thank you. Then, of course, we need to display that logic. So on the other side of things, when the user visits your website, you need to um, turn that saved data into whatever appearance your widget's going to have. And then you need to register the widget so that WordPress will know about it. So, and I don't know if you can read that, but I couldn't fit it on a slide otherwise. But this is basically just the bare bones, what it looks like when you write the widget code. I don't have any of the code for those pieces, but this is the, the structure. So when you define a widget class, it's extending the WP widget class, which is why you can very easily tap in and have it show up in the admin, um, just like a regular widget. You don't have to write all of those pieces, you just have to write the pieces that I told you about. So we're gonna declare it, we're gonna create the form, we're gonna write the save logic, the display logic, and then down at the end, we're going to call register widget so that our widget gets uh, hooked in and will appear in the appearance widget area. And to really get a sense of how you build these, I recommend just look under the hood. WordPress is open source. Go look at the WordPress widgets. If you have a plugin that has a widget, go look at the code for it, and you'll get a sense of how the widgets are written so you can learn to write your own. Transients. So transients are a way to temporarily cache data to save time. The WordPress has a transient API built in, and it's basically a temporary storage that WordPress has. The transients can have any sort of data in them, but they have a maximum expiration time, and they can expire sooner. They can be cleared out or disappear. Transients are Straightforward, you just define them with a name, whatever the value is, and then you give them that maximum lifetime. So, quick example, um, I've got up here a transient name. I'm including an ID that's kind of off screen. I'm also including a version. Um, this is just to make my transient name unique to match um, whatever data I'm storing about it. And then I have a simple loop where I am calling get transient with that name. And if I get that transient, that's going to return true. I'm going to know that I can just exit out of this loop and then go and do something with that. I'm sorry, not true. It's going to return the actual value that I stored in the transient. If it doesn't find that transient, either because it doesn't exist or it's expired, then it's going to return false. And I'm going to go into my loop here. I'm going to have some kind of code that gets pulled whatever data. Now, that could be a remote call to another system. It could be a set of complex queries. It could be something where I'm kind of marrying some data from different parts of the system. The point is, it's something that kind of might take a little more time than a simple database call. So 
you can use the transit system, transient system so you don't have to do it again and again. And then, of course, once you have that data, you want to call set transient, which is going to put that content into the transient system. So I kind of touched on this. You want to use transients for data that's more complex than a single database value. Um, otherwise, you're not, there's really no point. You might as well just pull your single value. And as I said, transients are great for caching remote data, complex queries, things that you have to put together. And they should only ever contain data that you can regenerate. So you don't want to be using it to store cart data or anything like that that, that, um, that is data that you need. It should be data that's complex to put together and therefore would benefit from increased um, time. Transients will stick around. So if you change your transient name, you want to be kind of careful about transients get cleared out if you call get transient with the same name again or if you specifically call delete transient. But otherwise, they're going to hang around. So if you change your transient name every time you change your function, um, you're going to leave all of these old transients hanging around in your system. So one thing you want to think about is clearing your transients, or maybe if you have a plugin, you can clear your tr like clear all the transients out if the plugin is deactivated. Things like that. It's something to be aware of. Okay. Last thing, WP cron. So WP cron lets you schedule all the things. Um, it is WordPress's internal time-based scheduling system. The thing to understand about it is it's only triggered by site visits. So if you don't get a lot of traffic on your site, it might um, not run exactly when you think it's going to. But it holds on to the jobs, and it will run as soon as somebody does visit the site again. So this is a little different from server cron that you might set up on your hosting provider, where things are going to always run at a set time. This is specifically triggered by site visits. And when you set something up, you give a time for the first thing. Then you give an interval, um, which WordPress has hourly, twice daily, or daily, and then you can also create your own custom intervals. So if you need something to happen every six hours or every 30 days, you can do that. Um, we only have a couple minutes, so <laughs> this is, um, I'm going to just leave this here. Basically, similar before, we're going to use an add action to hook our function name, in this case, ABC process feeds, to our hook name. And then we're also going to do a piece where we schedule it. We're going to check when we try to schedule it, if it is already scheduled, and if it's not, we're going to schedule it. And in this case, we're going to do that on the after switch theme, which is uh, when we switch to the theme. And then we want to unschedule it. So if it's in a theme or plugin, we're going to go and use a hook and make sure we unschedule it so that it's not running uh, forever in the system. So that is it. I did manage to finish in time, and we have a few minutes for questions. If you can come up to the microphone if you have a question so they can hear on the video. What are the, what are the alternatives to WP Cron as far as scheduling goes? So WP Cron is what's built into WordPress. There is a mechanism to um, take it out of there. Um, it involves a little bit of server savviness, but it is detailed in the Cron section of the plugin handbook. Do you have any plugins or anything like that that you would recommend instead of? Um, no, I mean I, I don't think I don't think there are any plugins. Well, I don't know a plugin that would set up its own thing. But the WordPress cron is built in. Mm -hmm. um, there are plugins that let you look at the cron and manage it. If you were going to do it through WordPress, there's kind of a way to separate it. Or there's also using cron that's on your server. Mm -hmm. So you could set something up to be run say on a specific URL or on a page visit, and you could, using a cron set up on your web host, visit that page, that URL. Okay, can trigger it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I think there was somebody in the back. Oh. Oh. No, it was me. I was just going to... Oh, you're just waving. Oh. You killed it. You did it. Hi. <laughs> Hello. My question is, when you were talking about widgets, I was thinking about how everything is saved, and when you go into the database, and it's... It's all sort of one big blob in the WP options area. And I didn't know if there was a way when you were creating a widget that you can have it saved not as serialized data. Why, why wouldn't you want it serialized? Sometimes moving things around, sometimes when I've had problems with other plugins and trying to see how to fix things. It's harder 
to do that with serialized data. Yeah, I mean, what I'd recommend is if you're trying to figure out what's happening, I would definitely turn on your debug and write things to your debug log. So when it's processing, turn on those debug flags, put some statements in there. That's actually what I neglected to show, is you can call error underscore log, and you can pass it whatever data is happening in real time. You could save some options as well. I, I would try to avoid having that be the long-term strategy, just because then you're kind of storing it twice. But if you're just trying to sort it out, I would, I would use the debugging. Yeah, you're welcome. So I think we're at time. I'm going to be around all day. I will probably be at the happiness bar later this afternoon, but feel free to find me at lunch or any time and ask me any questions. Again, the slide link is up there, so you can also reach me through my website and get all of this information and links. Thank you.